This is lesson two of chapter six. In this lesson, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about ionic and covalent bonding. Remember, we said that um, there are two types of compounds really that can form. Uh, they are ionic, like sodium chloride, table salt, and covalent, like water. And we're going to take a look at both these in more detail. So let's take a look at uh, covalence first. Let's define something called a molecule. Now, you've heard this term before, but here we're going to define it in terms of one of these types of bonding. A molecule is defined as a neutral group of atoms held by covalent bonds. This is important. Covalent bonding is holding molecules together. So what you have is you have, here's a water molecule. In a water molecule, you have hydrogen and oxygen bonded together. And what holds them is the sharing of electrons. They're both sharing a pair of electrons, essentially. And you have individual units in a covalent bond. So here are three examples. Here's oxygen. This is what's called diatomic oxygen, where you have two oxygens bonded together. Here again is water. And here is NH3. Now notice in all three of these cases, you have nonmetals. Because remember, covalent bonds are formed from nonmetals. Now, with ionic bonding, you do not have a molecule. Molecules do not exist with ionic bonding. In other words, you don't have a separate individual unit that you can single out. In ionic bonding, you have what's called a crystal lattice. And the lattice simply has alternating negative and positive and negative and positive ions. And you'll see that the negative ones are bigger, the positive ones are smaller. So let's take a quick look at the crystal lattice idea. Anytime you have an ionic bond, essentially these are all, all ions. So say this is a sodium plus ion, this is a chlorine minus ion. And these ions come together in a random fashion. It doesn't matter whether this sodium bonds with this chlorine or with this chlorine or with that chlorine or with this chlorine. It doesn't really matter. In fact, if you take a look at, say, your sodium atom and you ask, well, which chlorine belongs to you? I know your formula is NaCl. So you ask the sodium, which chlorine belongs to you? The chlorine can say, well, this one and this one and this one and the one in front of me, the one in the back of me neither one belongs to me, it's just we're saying that the ratio of us is one to one. That's the idea. And that's why you'll see these clean crystals whenever you're dealing with ionic compounds. This is called a crystal lattice, fancy word, that just says alternating positives and negatives and positive and negatives, like this huge, huge structure with alternating positives and negatives. This is true again of ionic compounds. A different picture than what you see in covalent compounds. In covalent compounds, the picture that we see is a sharing of electrons. So we can talk about whether the electrons are shared equally or unequally. So if you have yourself a what's called a nonpolar covalent bond, uh, nonpolar means the electrons are shared equally, which means there really isn't a pole, no pole. And by pole, we mean like a, a positive and a negative pole. Whereas if you do have a pole, you're called a polar covalent bond. In this case, electrons are shared unevenly. The examples that we see here are between carbon and hydrogen and oxygen and hydrogen. Now when oxygen and hydrogen form, oxygen being more electronegative will actually pull the electron density toward itself. And you can kind of see that here. You can see the hydrogen is becoming thin. The electrons around it are becoming thin. Oxygen is essentially grabbing more of the shared electrons toward itself. That's, again, because it is more electronegative. O is higher in electronegativity. In this case, carbon and hydrogen, if you check their electronegativities, they're about equal, which means their sharing of electrons is about equal. So hydrogen gets half of the electrons, and carbon gets half of the electrons. So when it is equal, you get yourself nonpolar. There is no pole. There is no difference. When it's unequal, you get yourself a polar bond. On this side, you get a positive charge because there's less electrons. On this side, you get a negative charge. There are more electrons. And that's what we mean by a polar bond. There's a pole created. And you can think of this pole as becoming like a sticky portion to the molecule. The molecule, I'm sorry, itself becomes sticky. This end becomes positive. This end becomes negative. So a neighboring molecule then will stick. The negative end of the neighboring molecule will stick this, to this molecule. And we'll get into that more and more. Here are 
The same concept applied to the whole entire molecule. So if you take a look at water, water molecules are very famously polar. What we mean by that is that there is an uneven charge distribution in a polar molecule. You'll see that on the top here, you have a lot of electron density. On the bottom, you don't have a lot of electron density. The bottom gets a plus charge, the top gets a minus charge. This is what we mean by a polar molecule. Whereas carbon dioxide molecules are nonpolar. It's equally shared. So this is oxygen, this is oxygen, this is carbon, this is CO2. But because you have two oxygens, essentially the sharing of the two oxygens is going to be equaled out. So this is why CO2 is a gas, because it is nonpolar. Uh, molecules are not sticky, whereas water is a liquid, because it is polar and molecules are sticky. So this is a good way of thinking about it. All right? So now the question is, well, how do we know if bonds are uh, ionic or covalent? How do we, def how, how do we decide? Uh, well, the technical way of deciding is by looking at the electronegativity difference between the atoms. Because remember, the more an atom wants electrons, the more likely it will be to pull electrons toward themselves. So looking at the electronegativity difference, if the difference between the electronegativities of the two elements is large, so here if it's from 1.8 to 3.3, this is a large difference, the bond will be ionic. This essentially means that one element does not want electrons, the other element really wants it, so one element will just give the electron over to the other. Because remember, ionics transfer electrons. If the difference is somewhere in between, it'll be what's called a polar covalent compound where there's unequal of sharing, one element pulls electrons toward itself, and if there's a really small difference between their desire for electrons, it'll be nonpolar, it'll be equally shared. So again, this is unequal sharing, and this is equal sharing, which creates a nonpolar covalent bond. So the examples that we've been working with, and a few more that uh, you can see here, CH4 is famously a nonpolar covalent compound, Water is famously a polar covalent compound. Sodium chloride, table salt, is ionic. So here, if you take a look at these two elements, their electronegativity difference is actually really tiny. Here, these two have high electronegativity differences, uh, or, I'm sorry, medium, so, so low, medium here, and very high here. Electronegativity difference, and that's why they're nonpolar, polar, and ionic. Okay, so we can actually do, finally, get to a practice problem. The question here is, do you expect these bonds to be covalent or ionic? Well, if we take a look at HCl, since hydrogen and chlorine are both nonmetals, when nonmetals come together, they will share electrons, we said. And that's because their electronegativity difference is small. Both nonmetals want to accept electrons. So in this case, you'll have yourself covalent bonding. Both these are nonmetals, so you get covalent bonding. With KBr, potassium is a metal, bromine is a nonmetal. Remember, the way to remember this is draw a quick little periodic table, and potassium sticks around right here, bromine sticks around on this side. So on the left side, you have low electronegativities. On the right side, you have high electronegativities, because electronegativity increases as you go to the top right. So there's a huge difference. You have metal and a nonmetal. And this will form an ionic bond. The metal will give up the electron to the nonmetal. And finally, here you have just two chlorines. Now it's possible for two of the same element to bond with itself. Obviously, here it has to be a sharing of electrons because both of them want electrons. So you have again a nonmetal which means they both desire electrons, and it'll form a covalent bond. So it's really as easy as taking a look at, do we have a metal and a nonmetal, or are both of them nonmetals? Now, to differentiate between two of these, can we also ask which one is polar, which one's nonpolar of the two covalents? Well, obviously this one, because you have the same element, both of them have the same desire for electrons, so this would be nonpolar they'll have an equally sharing, they'll share electrons equally. 
Whereas H and Cl, there's a difference between the electronegativities. So this one will be polar. Again, uh, unequal sharing of electrons. All right, and then the last thing we'll talk about. Oh, go ahead and, by the way, uh, try an example on your own for your own pleasure. Let's talk about something called bond energy. Uh, bond energy is the energy required to break a covalent bond. And the units are kilojoules per mole, as usual. So this is, we can take a look at, well, how strong are these bonds that have been formed? And we determine that by breaking the bond and seeing how much energy it took to break it. This is called bond energy. Now, if you take a look, there's a table on this next slide which shows you some bond energies and bond lengths. So what I want you to notice, first of all, take a look down here. You'll see that a single bond has a short bond length and a high bond energy. A double bond has, notice the bond length has gone down and the bond energy has increased. And a triple bond has the smallest bond length and the highest bond energy. We'll summarize this on the next page. Now take a look here. The carbon-hydrogen bond is short and really, really high. The carbon-chlorine is longer and lower. Uh, carbon-bromine is even longer and lower. And finally, carbon iodide is the longest and the lowest. So from this, we can surmise and we can uh, summarize them doing, uh, summarize it like this. We can say that a single bond is smaller or shorter. Uh, I'm sorry, let's say it again. A single bond, this is bond strength. A single bond uh, is the weakest. A triple bond is the strongest because here we're talking about bond strength. The double bond is in the middle. So the more bonds you have, like a triple bond, the stronger it is, the tougher it'll be to break it. On the bond length, the triple bond will have the shortest bond length. The single bond will have the longest bond length. So a triple bond essentially brings the atoms the closest together. So in other words, the shorter the bond, the stronger the bond. And that is the, the relationship. Let's do the same thing then to uh, ionic compounds. With ionic compounds, bond strength is measured by something called lattice energy. This is the energy it takes to break the ionic bond. And it, this is the energy that holds ions together. And two factors here. Ions have a high charge. If, you, if the ionic charges are high, like if you have plus 2 or plus 3, then you'll have a higher lattice energy. And also if the ions are small. So a quick example here is you have sodium fluoride and you have magnesium oxide. Now magnesium has a plus two charge, oxygen has a minus two charge, sodium has a plus one, fluorine has a minus one charge. So magnesium oxide has higher charges and magnesium oxide, the distance is smaller, notice. That's because the ions are smaller. Here the distance is greater, so magnesium oxide will actually have the higher lattice energy for those two reasons. All right, let's do a quick little example of this, and we'll set you loose. So which of these ionic compounds will have the lowest and which will have the highest lattice energy? What we're looking at, first of all, here are the charges. If you take a look at sodium chloride, you'll see that sodium has a plus one charge, chlorine has a minus one charge. Because both these are plus one and minus one, they'll be lower. This one is a plus one and a minus one. This calcium oxide is actually a plus two and a minus two, which means they have stronger lattice energy. So this one is the strongest. So this is the highest. Now between these two, what you've got is bromine is actually bigger and potassium is bigger than sodium and chlorine. That's because bromine and potassium are lower on the periodic table. So the smaller you are, the stronger the charge, which means this here will have the lowest. I know we went through that pretty quickly. We'll cover this again in class. Go ahead and look over these notes as needed and go ahead and do the last example problem, practice problem 0.5. And this completes for us lesson two of chapter six.